Hey everyone, we're back in John. Great Scott! That's a Back to the Future reference. It's actually been 519 days since we took a pause on John because of this new coronavirus thing that had just started infecting people in the States. But even longer than that, it has been 1,300 days, give or take a few, since we began the book of John at Church of the Valley in February of 2018. Three and a half years have gone on since we began our journey through the book of John, possibly the most well-known letter in all of the New Testament, if not the entire Bible. Usually when someone asks someone else, usually a Christian, where they should start to read the Bible if they want to get to know God a little bit better, what do they say? They point them to John, which if you remember, uh, I assume you've read it since February of 2018, actually begins with some pretty confusing first two verses. Here's how it begins, John 1, 1 and 2, in the beginning was the Word, say Word, and the Word, Word, was with God, and the Word was God, He was with God in the beginning. Anyone confused? Yeah. And we taught on this back in February of 2018, last decade, so I'm sure you totally remember that sermon. The sermon was actually called, God Be Like. And so here's what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to grab your Bibles and start in John chapter 1. We're going to go through the entire first 15 uh, chapters in John, all right? So go to John chapter 1, either in the Bible in front of you, on your phone, or the Bible you brought. And we're not going to read all of it, because that would literally take like two and a half hours. But here's some things that we know. Here was a point that came from that first sermon called God Be Like. The gospel in a simple sense is that God intervened. And false teaching is detrimental to our souls. Now, switch to chapter 2. We see Jesus performing what some call his first recorded miracle, where he turns water into wine at a wedding. We also studied Jesus clearing the temple from all of the people attempting to benefit financially from God's name. Then we go to chapter 3. We come to this conversation between Jesus and a Pharisee named Nicodemus. We call him Nick at Night. And from that message, we spoke about things like the kingdom of God is not a place, it's a person. And new birth happens to us, not by us. Then in chapter 4, we see Jesus having a conversation with the Samaritan woman at the well. We called one of the messages, Awkward Spiritual Conversations. A point taken from that message was that Jesus didn't allow the woman's sin to be her excuse to not have a spiritual conversation with Jesus. Then we move on to chapter 5, where there's a healing of a man who had been an invalid for 38 years on the Sabbath. A point we made known in that message was known as missing the point was this, that the Sabbath was a physical representation of our trust for God. Enter chapter 6, where we studied the feeding of 5,000 in a message called God Can. We pointed out that this story was not told so that we all could give more money to the church. That was not the point of it. This reason for this story was written down so that the readers could believe that Jesus is who he says that he is, which is the great I am. Then Jesus walks on water. He calls himself the bread of life. Many disciples leave Jesus after he speaks some pretty hard, thing, hard truth to them. Then we took a break in John for about five months, and then we got back into it in chapter 7, and it begins with Jesus going to the Feast of Tabernacles. One point from that message was to treat and see Jesus as anything but Lord and Master is to misunderstand Him completely. Then we head to chapter 8, where there is a bit of an asterisk. The end of chapter 7 and the beginning of chapter 8 have a story about Jesus seeing a woman caught in adultery. And the woman was about to be stoned. Men picked up stones, and Jesus uttered the famous words, Let ye who is without sin cast the first stone. And then each of them dropped their stones and went away downcast. Jesus says, I do not condemn you either. Go and sin no more. Great story. The problem is that this story was not found in the early transcripts of the Bible, and so we don't treat it like the rest of the Bible because it, is, as far as we understand, is not canonized. It was not put together. It was not inspired by the Holy Spirit or brought together like the rest of Scripture. So we had this difficult task of attempting to figure out how to treat this passage because many preachers and teachers of the Bible seem to do one of two things with this. They ignore it completely and just skip over it, or they teach it as truth, as it was written as like everything else we find in Scripture. 
So we took a look at how we interpret Scripture and why it is so important to our understanding of God and His character in His own words. Our conclusion was that while the story probably happened, or at least something similar to it, we ought not treat stories the same way we treat Scripture while also teaching us that Scripture interprets Scripture, and so the story actually is very in line with what Jesus seems to do in other situations that are similar found in other parts of Scripture. So here's an excerpt. Here's one of the things that we said in that sermon. So we're going to acknowledge that this passage isn't one that is easy to understand. It's not written the same way that the rest of the New Testament is written, but that doesn't mean it's not useful. I would just encourage you to see it as a story that probably happened rather than build your theology around the story alone. That message was called Desiring to Obey in Spirit and in Truth. And if you're interested, you can go to the website. Laura's done a phenomenal job of cataloging all of the sermons. Another point that was made regarding spirit and truth was this, that spirit and truth are not in conflict or contrast, but are in cooperation of who God is and what He does. Then we continued through chapter 8 regarding Jesus' testimony about Himself, and then entered into chapter 9 where Jesus heals a man who was blind since birth. We unpacked this story about the blind man since birth, that the public opinion was that he was blind because of either his own or his parents' sin, and we spent the entire sermon explaining the fact that difficult circumstances are not punitive restitution, but they're opportunities for dependence and the glory of God to be put on display. Then we head into chapter 10 where if you were with us, I'm sure many of you remember this makeshift sheep pen that Pastor Mike built, and he pointed out that sheep listen to shepherds' voices, or to their shepherd's voice, and so he said famously, I'm a sheep. Some of you remember. Then on to chapter 11, where we begin the narrative of the death and resurrection of Lazarus. We spent four sermons, four weeks on this chapter alone, and a big point that came out of that narrative was, by the grace of God, The works of God reveal the glory of God in the Son of God. Then we took another break for about two months and jumped back into chapter 12 where we began the Passion Week from the triumphant entry of Jesus on what we know as Palm Sunday to the Jews' disbelief of Jesus to Jesus predicting His death for the first time. When we taught in John chapter 12 around verse 37 through 50, we spoke about hardness of heart. And that hardness of heart happens when we hear the Word of God and reject or ignore it. We then, in February of 2020, entered into chapter 13, where Jesus washes the disciples' feet, predicts yet again the betrayal that Judas would do to Him, and Jesus predicts Peter's denial also, while also pointing out that everyone will know that disciples are His disciples by the way that they love one another, John 13, 35. We did chapter 14, where Jesus makes the claim that He is the only way to the Father, and He promises that the Holy Spirit will come. And this point that we hit on over and over again was made, that the will of God is revealed in the Word of God, which is written by the Spirit of God. Then in March of 2020, we began chapter 15 of John, speaking about abiding and the vine and the branches. And on March 8, 2020, do you, does anyone remember this time? We taught a message called Chosen to Love from chapter 15, 9 through 25, assuming that the following week we would conclude chapter 15. Well, now it's September 12th, 2021, and here we are studying the final two verses of chapter 15 regarding the Holy Spirit, the Advocate, the Comforter, the Helper, who walks alongside and inside the believer to point out the truth of God's Word to open the eyes to the message of the gospel, to convict us of sin and transgressions, and to be God with us, inside of us, guiding us in spirit and in truth. So, a couple of uh, analytics. There have been 55 sermons in this book since February of 2018 that we've preached at Church of the Valley. And we've had three different teachers teach this letter, myself, Pastor Mike, and Daniel Delwood. Our teaching team has now grown to seven, including Chris Gilmore, our new family pastor. So we have Ruth Zilka, Karen Miller, Spencer Chen, and Chris Gilmore, who, and my hope is that all of them will contribute to this series before it is finished because we have 15 more sermons to do, and then we can finally sit back and praise God for His work through this letter that countless people have been encouraged and sanctified through here at Church of the Valley. 
I'd say this letter has taken as long as it has, not just because it is a longer letter, especially in the New Testament, but we've taken breaks for seasons and did not engage in it for over a year while we as a community did much of our gathering online in 2020. I'd like us to conclude this letter, but I don't want us to just get over the letter, just get it over with. I want us to see the power of the most important week in all of human history, which we're jumping into, where a makeshift rabbi carpenter hung on the cross for the sins of many and rose from the dead so that we could have life in the name of the resurrected king. Our goal is to conclude the book of John this year, before Christmas, while we walk through and teach the rest of this amazing letter written by the disciple whom Jesus loved, also known as the apostle of love, John. And as we pointed out often, this letter actually has the purpose of the letter explained towards the end in the letter. Here's what it says, John 20, verses 30 and 31. We've said it a lot. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So this letter, it was written so you could have your mind blown spiritually. So you could see Jesus for who he is. So that you could have life in Jesus' name and love him for what he has done for you. All right, so here we go. We're getting back into the book of John, and today we're going to unpack two verses, the two verses that Mark read for us about the Holy Spirit. So quick disclaimer, the Holy Spirit's confusing. Can anyone testify to this? Okay, the rest of you are looking at me blankly. Anyone who thinks they understand the Holy Spirit completely is probably lying to you. But we take the approach of everything that we say about him, like Jesus and the Father, the the Trinity, everything that we say about the Holy Spirit, the Father, and the Son come from what the Holy Spirit actually says about himself in the book that the Holy Spirit authored. So are we ready to get back into this book? Okay, I need a breath, I need to pray, because that was a lot of just talking. So here we go. (sighs) Father, I pray for us. I pray, God, that you would use these two verses today, this unpacking of this passage, that you would light something in us to not just want to hear your word, but put it into practice, because if we love you, why wouldn't we do what you say? Would you use this time for your glory? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So here we go. John 15, verse 26. When the advocate comes whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. Now, in order to see what Jesus is trying to say here to the disciples, we have to go back to just the passage that precedes this to get a little bit more context and culture around this particular point he's making to the disciples, because my guess is not everyone watched the last sermon we did in John before you came here today. So John 15, 18 through 25, here's what Jesus says. If the world hates you, he's speaking to the disciples, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name. For they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father as well. If I have not done among you the works no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. As it is, they have seen and yet have hated both me and my father. But this is to fulfill what is written in their law. They hated me without reason." Now we come to this passage with a little bit more of understanding of why Jesus is sending the Spirit. These disciples had been warned that they would be hated for the sake of Christ, and they were going to be left alone as Jesus would leave them to go back to his Father. And it is from the context that Jesus makes known that he will send the third person of the Trinity, the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He will send the Spirit. Now, real talk, because we just got out of a serious talking about keeping it real, this Holy Spirit, the Spirit, it gets treated, talked about, and thought about in some pretty weird ways. A few misconceptions of the Spirit of God, that He is a force, 
to be used or controlled or purchased. Look with me at a passage in Acts chapter 8 about a guy that is nicknamed Simon the Sorcerer and his expectation that he could purchase the Holy Spirit. Acts 8, 18. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on the hands of the apostles, he offered them money and said, give me also this ability so that everyone I lay my hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, may your money perish with you. I won't say how that really translates because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that He may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. So, real quick, here's the thing about the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is not an it to be purchased or used, but a person who leads and guides those whom He indwells. The Holy Spirit is not a thing to be bought, but a person who is gifted to those who have trusted Jesus for their salvation. Another misconception is that people also believe that he, the Holy Spirit, wants a lot of credit and is feeling left out as the lesser known third person of the Trinity. But look at the passage that we're going to study next week. In John 16, 12 through 14, Jesus says, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me, Jesus says, because it is from me, Jesus, that he will receive what he will make known to you. The truth of the spirit is to point you to what he actually says about himself, him being God in three persons. Too often we claim that we live by the Spirit, but we don't obey what He says. So, verse 8 and 9 of 16, when He comes, He will prove the world to be wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment, about sin because people do not believe in me, Jesus. 1 John chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, the Apostle John says, this is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. The Holy Spirit opens our eyes to the solution to our sin, which is the work of the Son. That is what is so beautiful about the Spirit's work in the believer's life, that He opens our eyes, that there is a solution. We are sinful. We are messed up. We are in need of help. And the solution is the Son. The Spirit's main job, if you're going to take one note, here's the one to take the note of. The Spirit's main job is to glorify and point to Jesus, to convict the world of their sin, and to make known that the solution, which is not an effort or a substance, but it is in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. So don't, be, don't claim to be led by the Spirit unless all you are doing is magnifying Jesus Christ because that's what it means to be led by the Spirit. I think sometimes we want the Spirit to be the one that shows us some new revelation or gives us an experience that is bigger and more holy than what His Word says that He does. You want to know what the Spirit's doing right now? He's exalting Jesus in all that He does. The Holy Spirit's distinctive role is to fulfill what some people call the floodlight ministry in relation to Jesus. So far as this role was concerned, the Spirit was not yet, according to John 7, 29. In literal Greek, it was, it was future tense. While Jesus was on earth, only when the Father had glorified Him, John 17, which we'll study in a few weeks, could the Spirit's work of making men aware of Jesus' glory begin? So here's a quote from J.I. Packer, a wonderful theologian and a preacher that I appreciate. He says, I remember walking to church one winter evening to preach on the words, He will glorify me, John 16, 14. Seeing the building floodlit as I turned the corner and realizing that this was exactly the illustration my message needed, when flood lighting, flood lighting is well done, the floodlights are placed so that you do not see them. I was thinking about this cross, and we don't have floodlights to show it off, but I noticed the light that comes through the windows gives you a better understanding of what, where the cross is and the fact that you can see it. And the floodlights are placed so that you do not see them. In fact, you are not supposed to see where the light is coming from. 
What you are meant to see is just the building on which the floodlights are trained to be. The intended effect is to make it visible when otherwise it would not be seen for the darkness, and to maximize its dignity by throwing all its details into relief so that you can see it properly. This perfectly illustrated the Spirit's new covenant role. He is, so to speak, the hidden floodlight shining on the Savior. Or think of it this way. It is as if the Spirit stands behind us, throwing light over our shoulder onto Jesus, who stands facing us. The Spirit's message to us is never, look at me, listen to me, come to me, get to know me, but always look at Him, see His glory, listen to Him, hear His word, go to Him and have life. Get to know Him and taste His gift of joy and peace. The Spirit, we might say, is the matchmaker, the celestial marriage broker, whose role is to bring us and Christ together and ensure that we stay together. So keep this in mind. When we think about the Spirit, He wants to point you to the Son. He wants to glorify Jesus, not Himself. He wants you to know and be known by Jesus. And the Holy Spirit's purpose for you and for me is to bow down to Jesus not raise himself up so that we can be more spiritual. So with that in mind, plus the context in which Jesus is speaking these words about the Advocate, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, let's read them one more time. Eh, That's not true. We're going to read them a few more times. 1526, when the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. So imagine being the disciples right now. Jesus is speaking about going away. He's speaking about leaving them, telling them how difficult it is to be, it's about to be, and he says, but my Father will send the advocate, the Greek word is parakletos in Greek, the helper, the counselor, the encourager, the mediator, the assistant. He is being sent because these disciples did have the luxury of walking with Jesus, following his lead, being taught by him and learning from him, but they are about to be indwelled. They will have God with them, inside of them, leading them and guiding them. It's probably easier for us to understand this in 2021, what a big deal this was if you have personally experienced the gift of the Holy Spirit leading you. See, this isn't as much a feeling or an emotion as it is the truth of God's actual presence and spirit inside of you. The purpose of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life is not to be felt, but obeyed. And if you want to experience the Holy Spirit, don't wait for a feeling, obey His Word, and experience the growth that comes from that. Here's what I mean. It's easy to believe that the Spirit's inside of you when you feel something or you experience something, but what about when our recollection wanes? What about that experience starts to seem more like a faint memory than this all-encompassing monumental moment that we remember? Last week, Jordan, who now lives in Irvine but comes up and still leads worship, which is awesome, uh, led us in a song called Christ Be Magnified. And there was a verse in that song. I'd never heard it before. There was a verse in that song that stuck with me that went like this. I won't be formed by feelings. I hold fast to what is true. And the point we're trying to make over and over is the Bible isn't believed with all of our hearts without the author living inside of us and opening our eyes to the truth of His Word. The Spirit sent from the Father, Jesus makes a point of this. He says it twice in the same sentence, that this helper, the Spirit, is divine from the Father, and He would be sent for what reason? You ready? You ready? You know what I'm going to say. Testify! That's what He came to do. But not just testify about anything. Testify about Jesus. To testify about me, Jesus says. This might be the most misunderstood reference to the Holy Spirit in Scripture because what Jesus is making known is that the Spirit makes known who Jesus is. So if you are in this room today and you have a relationship with Jesus, it's because the Holy Spirit opened your eyes. He did the work, not you. So let me read 26 one more time. When the Advocate comes, you guys should memorize this by now. I did. Whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. What will the Spirit do? He will testify about Jesus. What about Jesus? Who he is and what he has done and what he has done for you and for I. 
One of the weirdest things about Christianity to me is how clear it is for some people and how convoluted it is for others. The the world may see Christianity as this moral reform belief system. If you can clean yourself up enough, you are a Christian. And Jesus becomes, in that case, more of an example to be emulated than a king to be bowed down to. Fundamentalists may see Christianity as a way to control people into begrudging submission to not act the fool or do things in public that would make Jesus look bad. The prosperity types see Jesus as a means to an end to live their best lives now and be able to attain material blessings that will make us feel better about ourselves in the here and now. And for the shallow, Christianity stands for a belief that can be kind of pulled out like a get-out-of-jail-free card in Monopoly any time that we think it should be played and it's prudent or it benefits the person playing the card. But not one of those things are what the Bible teaches about following Jesus Christ. Not one of those things is what the Holy Spirit would lead any of us to interpret the Scriptures to actually imply. See, look at what Jesus says about following Him in Mark 8. Then He called the crowd to Him along with His disciples and said, Whoever wants to be My disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow Me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for My sake, for the gospel, will save it. I don't hear these words and think, man, that sounds like a nice massage. Following Jesus is uncomfortable. It's not easy. It's not even attractive without the Spirit of God making known the beauty and the majesty of Jesus. So we really need to look look to the Scriptures and see who gets the credit for our belief in Jesus in the first place. The Holy Spirit removes the veil, gives us eyes to see, gives us the want to pursue. It's the Holy Spirit making the picture and the person of Jesus Christ crystal clear in our lives. Romans 8, 15 says, The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. Abba in English is Daddy. The Holy Spirit brought about our sonship. He brought about our salvation, our adoption, our intimate relationship with the Father. We have been sealed and cemented by the Spirit so that we can be in the presence of God in this life and the next. And God does all of that Himself in the third person of the Trinity. And where does He want the credit and acknowledgement to go? To Jesus. So the Spirit will testify about Jesus, and then he says, verse 27, and you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. Church, if the gospel makes sense to you, then you ought to praise God for his work in your life. Not just being more moral or holy or less sinful, but praise God that anything you do for God is enabled by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. If the gospel doesn't make sense to you, the Holy Spirit ought to be the most offensive name of anyone anywhere because the Bible teaches that it is impossible to do anything with any eternal substance without the Spirit of God doing the work in you. The Spirit not only does the work, but He doesn't want the credit. He wants the Son to be glorified. He wants the Son, Jesus, to be worshipped, not the sun in the sky. He wants the Son to be magnified. That is how you can best honor God in three persons, is being led by the Spirit to exalt the name of Jesus, because under no other name is there power and freedom and salvation. Paul writes to the church in Philippi, and he says, Therefore, God exalted Him, Jesus, to the highest place and gave Him the name that is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know what I just realized? I get paid and support my family by the fact I get to talk about Jesus. Come on! That is the best. And you might not be supported to do that, but you are no less a missionary than I am. Because the same Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead resides in you. So look at how the Spirit wrote through the human author John when he spoke about the beginning. John, in 1 John chapter 1, he says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, 
This we proclaim concerning the word of life. Spoiler, that's Jesus. The life appeared. We have seen it and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is only possible for any man, woman, or child to see and understand if the Holy Spirit enables us to do so. Jesus says that you also must testify. He's speaking to the disciples who will become the apostles, who will write the New Testament. The band of misfits would eventually see Jesus alive after he rose from the dead, and the the early church would explode all over Jerusalem, all over Asia Minor, Turkey, and, and Iraq, Greece, and all of Europe, because the Spirit would empower, empower and enable these men to proclaim the kingdom of God. And the church would be built through the retelling of this message that Jesus lived, that he died, and that he rose again so that sinners could be made right before God. Not because of their abilities, but because of their belief that Jesus is who he says that he is and that he died and rose again so that we could have life. Next week is part two. This week's sermon says the Spirit points to the Son, part one, and I get to do a part one and part two inside of a series called In Jesus' Name, Amen. But next week is part two of this thought regarding the Holy Spirit pointing to the Son. But these disciples were with Jesus from the beginning of His ministry and the beginning of the church being born, future tense. Let me conclude with this. My favorite passage in all of Scripture regarding the Holy Spirit is another portion of the gift that He is for every believer. So if you have committed your lives to Jesus, if you have trusted Christ a long time ago, lately, or you're about to today, you need to understand what the gift of the Holy Spirit does inside of you and what He does for you. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, the Apostle Paul writes and he says, "...and you also were included in Christ." When you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Jesus is speaking to the disciples to let him know he must go away so that the Holy Spirit can come and lead and guide them. But Paul, who's already indwelled by the Holy Spirit, points out to the church in Ephesus that the Spirit not only comes to help us, but He is our guarantee of our future inheritance. He is our deposit. He is the reality that God is with us now. And we are included with Christ because the Spirit is the seal of that promise. And when you hear a promise from God, you shouldn't even call it a promise, you should call it a fact. A preacher known as Francis Chan once asked, if the Holy Spirit left you, would you even notice? I prefer to ask it another way. Do you realize that your commitment to Christ came with the Holy Spirit that is evidence of the promise that God will never leave or forsake you, that He will guide you, and He is with you? Do you realize that, church? That you are indwelled by the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead. You are indwelled by the Spirit that hovered over the waters as God was creating everything in Genesis 1, verse 2. And we are enabled by the Spirit to love and serve and glorify Jesus Christ with our lives, our words, our actions, our resources, our time, our money, our friendships, our professions, and even our examples. I ask that we as a community don't attempt to do everything in our own strength, but we depend on, rely on, and are led by the Spirit who resides in us by reading and obeying His Word. But we do it for the right reasons. Not only to grow, which is a benefit when our motives are correct, but because we love Him because He first loved us. And if we love Him, why wouldn't we do what He tells us to do in His Word? So I'm going to pray, and the worship team's not going to come up. Surprise. We have something for you to do. So get scared. I'm going to pray for us. 
Father, I, I pray that we as a community wouldn't allow your word, which we read a lot of it today and talked a lot about things you say in your word today. God, I pray that we want, wouldn't allow it to go in one ear and go out the other, that we'd sit for a moment in the magnitude of when you speak, we ought to listen and obey. God, you did first love us. We didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. We couldn't gain it. You did everything for us, and you've been gifting us ever since. And so, God, as we have the opportunity to respond in the next few moments, Lord, I, I pray that some of us would be thinking about, hey, Lord, I, I think I should be in community, and that, God, you would guide them to a community group. God, I pray for those of us who maybe our next step is baptism. Lord, I pray that you would convict them where they haven't obeyed in that sense, and it is a simple way of celebrating outwardly what you've already done inwardly. God, I pray that you'd stir in your people that are part of this church to give of their finances where they feel led to because they've made an agreement between you and them, and they know that that money does not justify them, but it is an act of worship. God, I pray that each of us in our own personal obedience would be willing to put into practice what you stirred in us today through your word and every day as we read your word. And may we not only look more like you, may we magnify and glorify you more because of the work you're doing in us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.